Would you like to know the secret to having a fulfilling career inside of the music business, even as an independent artist? See, I know a lot of you out there have been grinding at your music business, some of you for not just a year, but five years, 10 years even, and it doesn't feel very fulfilling, right? So when you're in that startup phase, you have to wear you know, a bunch of different hats and it's a lot of work. And we are so focused on the science of achievement. How do I get to where I'm trying to go that we ignore the art of fulfillment, which is you know being content with what you have and enjoying the journey and having joy through the journey to even through all the downs, you know? So today in this video, I wanna break down exactly how we have a more fulfilling career inside of the music business. And the first thing we have to do is we have to ask ourselves the question, why are people so unfulfilled to begin with? And I think if we really look at it, artists are unfulfilled for a few different reasons. One is they're focusing on surface level success. We see the people that are in the big fancy music videos, playing the big arenas, with the big fancy cars and the fancy clothes and the fancy guitars or keyboards or whatever in the big fancy studio. And that's what success means. I remember back in the day when I was growing up, getting on a record label meant you were successful. It was this superficial thing. Once you're signed, all your problems go away because that used to be the sort of magic bullet that the music industry would sell to artists. Like, oh yeah, once you get signed, now you're gonna blow up and be successful or we're gonna shelve you for a more successful artist. They don't tell you that part, but <laughs> you know, that, that's what basically happened, right? But we focused a lot on service level success and we built narratives of what it means to have success in the music business based on those things. And it turns out that that's not a very healthy way for us to look at this business. It drives a lot of people insane. In fact, how many people have fallen into this problem where you're looking at your metrics every day. Like think about this, you're looking at your uh, Spotify monthly listeners, you know, how many people are listening to you right now. You're looking at that, you're looking at how many streams, or not, not how many streams, how many views went up on your reels. They went from 17 to 50, you know, and you're, oh, okay, you know, hyper-focusing on view count. That can drive you insane. Some of y'all have done that and you know and can attest in the comments that can drive you flat out crazy. Just always checking your metrics, especially in the beginning where it's almost like advantageous if you could never look at the stats until like, I think this would be a very productive thing to do. It would be very hard for some people to get certain analytics, but it would be like, you can't look at your data until a year after posting. So just post a whole bunch and at the end of the year, we'll show you what happened. I almost feel like that would be better for incentives because people get so focused where they post something and then they're just staring at it for the next hour and a half, just waiting for it to blow up. And that's not healthy, it's a waste of time. And it's a distraction. As uh, this songwriting coach, Connor Frost, I heard him once say, um, he was talking about songwriting, but I'm gonna repurpose it for this, which is, it's never been easier to build a music business by yourself as an independent artist but it's also never been easier to be distracted so much that you actually never take action and build it in the first place. So we're so distracted on looking at our metrics every day. How many followers did I get today? How many likes did I get on this post? How many views did I get? How much is my Spotify listeners going up? We're just looking at it every day and driving ourselves crazy. And then we also fall into the comparison trap. We're looking at all the other artists and where they're at. Well, how come they have 70,000 monthly listeners on Spotify and I only have 150. You go through that comparison trap, you're gonna drive yourself crazy because where someone's at right now has no relationship to where you're at right now because you're at a different point in the journey. It's like if we all started races at different times and that's basically what happened. Imagine an artist started a race in 1999 some of you weren't even born yet, right? Do you think they would have a little bit of a leg up on your music career? Of course they would, they've been doing it longer, right? So you can't judge someone who's been at the game 10, 15 years longer than you, or even if it's five or eight years longer than you, and say, how come I'm not where they are? We're basically, we're the same age. How come they're more successful than me? That stuff is poison to your mindset because it's got you looking outwards when you should be looking inwards. You should be looking at, okay, what can I do to increase these numbers? What can I execute to actually improve my situation? But if we're constantly comparing ourselves to other artists, now listen, we can look at what other artists are doing. 
so that we can get strategies for ourselves so that we can go, oh, that's a cool video idea. I can do that for me. Oh, that's a really cool uh, giveaway concept. I'm going to borrow that for my giveaway. Oh, their fan club is really cool. I'm going to borrow that for my fan club. But looking at it like how come they have 500 fan club members, even though they've been at it five years longer than me, and I only have one fan club member. You can't do that. It's not a fair comparison. You are quite literally comparing apples and oranges. That's one journey that's been at it longer than you. And even if they'd only been at it like a year less than you and blew up, that's okay. I'll tell you right now, I have personally spent a few years of my music career cutting really hard through the forest in the wrong direction. <laughs> Not towards civilization, just cutting thicker into the Amazon, to use a little analogy there. I'm just cutting deeper into the forest. Like, I'm working real hard, guys. We're going to see success soon. But I'm just cutting deeper into the forest. And then I have to realize, wait a minute, I don't know where I'm going. Let me get up on a tree and see if I'm actually making any progress. And I get up in the tree and I look around and I'm like, oh, I'm going the wrong way. So to use a fun little analogy, I, we've, I think we've all done that, okay? I, myself included, right? So don't get so, you know, um, don't be so critical of yourself just because you're not somewhere compared to somebody else. Compare yourself to your own journey, okay? I think it's a Jordan Peterson quote. It's like, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who other people are today, right? That's n Looking at who other people are today and judging yourself is just a toxic road that I hope I can save somebody watching this video from going down that rabbit hole. Okay, the other thing is an alignment issue. Now, I want to elaborate on that a little bit more. So an alignment issue, people may be like, what are you talking about? A lot of artists... I've talked about this in one of my videos where I talk about how society has programmed artists to fail. Uh, go watch that after you watch this one. But I talk about how basically artists view business as bad, right? We've been conditioned that way through popular media, movies, all different kinds of things. We've been programmed to believe that entrepreneurship and business is bad, okay? We see, like, like, I'll just do one example. Like, all the big villains in most movies are like some millionaire billionaire that's trying to, you know, Dr. Evil is going to blow up the world unless he gets one billion dollars, you know. <laughs> it's always something like that. And get it. Don't get me twisted here. I love movies, even if that is the trope. Like, I love Austin Powers, even though Dr. Evil is the evil <laughs> billionaire. Um, but the whole point is there's programming at play here to get you to think business is bad. So when you become a music entrepreneur, you become a professional musician, I'm, I need to like interject this because I said this on threads and it made a lot of people mad, but it made a lot of people happy. So I'm gonna say it here too, which is if you're trying to get into the music business to escape capitalism, I don't think you understood what the music business was or is um, because what you are doing is creating a business around your art. That is what you are doing, okay? And if you subconsciously think that business is bad, you will never strive to be something that you think deep down is bad. That's just the truth. And so when I say there's an alignment issue with a lot of artists and that's why they're not fulfilled, that's what I'm talking about, is there's a lot of artists who want to be successful monetarily, I'll say it. Yes, they want success in other domains. They want to have impact on their fans' lives. They want to bring uh, attention to causes they care about. I get that. But they want to have money to pay their bills. So sorry to some of the purists out there, but yes, in some respect, success can be monetary, right? And if you believe that to achieve monetary success is evil in some way, you'll never strive to be successful, but you'll think, I want to have a successful music career, but somehow evade doing any of the stuff that builds a music career. It's just not going to happen. And so you have artists that are out there who believe these narratives and ideologies that are being programmed into us by society about how entrepreneurship is bad. So you should buy my book about how I explain how entrepreneurship is bad. And I just look at them and I just like, are you kidding me right now? Like, you know, like I'm not, I'm not getting political or anything, but there's people out there that will sell the idea that you can't have success because entrepreneurship is evil, but they themselves are entrepreneurs selling a product that is telling you that what they're doing 
either either in their minds they're evil and they know they're doing evil or they're trying to trick you into thinking this is evil because they don't want you to do what they're doing so they can keep all the rewards for themselves i tend to believe it's option number two that's me personally i think the majority of the reason business is demonized in culture is to get artists to not understand it so that they're easily controllable in their music business think about it do you think labels want you to know the intricacies of how you collect all your royalties because it is a little bit convoluted you got to have a pro you're signed up with you got to get hooked up with the distributor like tunecore distro kit or whoever you know you got to get signed up with song trust or find a way to get these um i think it's sound exchange get all these other additional royalties it's a little convoluted right do you think labels want artists on mass to know that information why would they want that so that they can charge them to do that for them that's how it's been in the music business forever. And that's what I hopefully am encouraging uh, artists to do on this channel is to break out of that and to figure out that, oh, I can figure out the tools of business to use perfectly in align with my own values because just because you become a business person doesn't mean you do things in a sleazy way. It, it means you just start to do business. And people have demonized business that some people don't know the difference between like, I'm just gonna start a, you know, a business that's not predatory and a, and a business that is predatory. They don't know the difference. And hopefully you understand that being a musician is a great business to be in. You help impact people's lives for the long term. Some people buy products like McDonald's, it's gone in five to 10 minutes and it's never coming back unless they buy it again. Music has this lifetime impact that it can have on people. And it's one of the greatest feelings to have. I'm, some of you can attest to this as well in the comments. But like when I've had people comment on our band's page and say, these are the lyrics that I needed to hear right in this moment in my life, thank you. It's like, what a greater feeling of impact. And that's the business you're in. So building a business around that and spreading that to more people, so what? You sell some vinyls and some shirts and some fan clubs and some other stuff. Does that make you evil? No, it makes you every artist who's ever existed throughout humankind. Like... Even back in the day, I'm not even going to go into this. I have a whole like course where I've dove, dove into the history um, of entrepreneurship and how it relates to the music business and how some of the first entrepreneurs were musicians and all this kind of stuff. But hopefully you understand that there's a lot of alignment issues. So I want to talk now about the science of achievement. I want to talk about, okay, we have to, we understand hopefully now that business can be a good thing as long as you're not trying to exploit people and manipulate people for, to get them you know to buy something that's negative for them it's going to hurt them you know like i'm not even going to say it i'm not going to go down that rabbit hole but you know there's there's definitely products out there that we can probably think of that fit that category so um to move on we now understand that there has to be a way to achieve okay so we help hopefully embrace business so we have to look at okay i have to start setting goals now but not just any other dumb goal that i like myself have set when I'm just kind of generally goal setting. I'll tell you, I'll just be, yeah, I wanna do this. Cool, that's not a good goal at all. So I learned from one of my mentors, the idea of a smart goal. What is a smart goal? Well, nobody wants dumb goals, so let's have a smart goal. SMART is an, ac an acronym. <laughs> trying to say that word five times fast. Um, but it's an acronym. It means, um, uh, what's the, <laughs> I forgot the first one, it's, it's um, Scalable, right? Measurable, actionable, result-based, and time-driven. Gosh, I'm pretty sure that S one, I'm missing the S. Oh man, that's, that's, that's gonna, it's probably gonna come back to me. But the whole idea that you can get from that, let's start from, we're gonna do mark goals for the moment. <laughs> so measuring them. Okay, you have to be able to measure it. When I say something like, I wanna, you know, uh, have, like, I want to be a millionaire. That's not really measurable, right? I want to get $5 a week from streaming. I want to get $10 a week from streaming, $20 a week from streaming. I want to get $500 a month from all of my music income. I want to get $1,000 a month. That's a measurable goal. We can tell how close or far we are from that goal, right? That's how you know you're on the track to have a good goal, or at least a marked goal. <laughs> Actionable. You have to be able to take action on it, right? So for instance, saying something like, I wanna make it in the music business. 
what action can you derive from that sentence? There's not a lot of action that can be derived from it. But if I say, I want to make $500 a month, so measurable, through my email list, so I have to send three sales camp, three sales camp, I keep saying this, sales campaigns this month, three sales campaigns. And you think of that, that's a measurable action-based goal. You can actually take some action on that. And it's a little bit result-based already as well. We're thinking about the result we're trying to get. Okay, I'm, the measurement and the result is $500. So I know if I get $400, I didn't quite get to my goal, right? So, but there is a result that's gonna come out of that. And then time-based. Now we can throw at the end of this within a month, right? We've been throwing that sort of subtly through the whole example. But the idea is it's got all these elements to it where it's measurable, you can take action on it, it's result-based, and it's time-driven. And then the S, I thought was scalable, but now it's, yeah, that's gonna be just a fun clip that you guys get to have in these videos, is that I gave you mart goals instead of smart goals. But I could have sworn that the S was scalable, meaning that like, okay, you can, once you've got this whole thing built out, you can do this at greater intensities and volumes um, just by changing the measurement, changing the action that you're taking and the results that you're trying to get. So having good goals, goals that are actually smart or mart, and being consistent, that's the next thing, is just actually implementing on a consistent basis and not getting distracted by all the stuff that we mentioned earlier where people are trying to fill you with jealousy and envy and lust and all this kind of different stuff about, oh, and then you're just like thinking, looking around and you're not focused on what's actually mattering in your music business, which is like taking action on messaging fans, creating email lists, creating sales campaigns. If you're not writing music, <laughs> writing more music, obviously. Like to me, hopefully everyone understands in this channel that you should like take your music seriously. <laughs> I get some comments sometimes from people like, all you talk about is business where you talk about music. I'm like, dude, that's not what this channel is about. I did have a channel about that at one point. People weren't really that into it. I like this better, um, personally. So uh, it's, it's something I'm really interested in. Plus, I like writing songs, but you know, there's other people that are doing that way better than me. So why try to compete with them, right? But I know business really well, so that's fun. Anyway, you have to be consistent at something. You have to keep doing it over and over and over and over and over again. And so as you, let's say, are trying to get good at messaging fans, I know that can be kind of a weird thing at first to actually just message someone who's a fan, but really a stranger in reality, and try to reach out to them. That's a weird thing, but you do that enough times, you build the skills, you get rid of the uncomfortableness of doing it. It's like when you play live. The first show, you're tense. I remember my first show, my like legs were locked and I just couldn't hardly you know, engage on stage. But then as I did it more, I was like, okay, whew, breathe, have more fun. you know. And then you loosen up and by the 10th show, you're not you know, worried so much about the audience anymore. You're just focusing on trying to do uh, what you're trying to do and execute. So consistency is key, but here's another thing, tracking. A lot of people do not track their activities. So for example, if you are messaging fans, you need to be tracking how many fans you're messaging. If you're tracking you know, how many sales did I get this month from this particular campaign. You need to be tracking that. How many sales, or excuse me, how many streams did I get as a result of this ad campaign? You need to be tracking that and have some way to track it. Now sometimes, like for example, you can figure out some stuff with Meta Ads Manager. If you have an ad that's running, you can get a lot of data just by having the Meta Ads Manager. But some things like messaging your fans, you may need to create a spreadsheet for. And my clients, they get their own personalized spreadsheets and stuff. But the whole idea is you need to create some sort of method of tracking this information. You need to create a method to take what's happening in your music business and like pull it down to earth. Because <laughs> right now it's like all up in here. You know, up in here, up in here, y'all gonna make me, sorry. I, I had to, it was there. Anyway, but you know, it's up in your head. You need to pull it down to earth and start figuring out, okay, how many people am I messaging? How many songs am I writing a month? How many songs am I releasing a month? You know, am I on a monthly releasing schedule? Am I on a bi-monthly releasing schedule? A quarterly releasing schedule? Am I one of those people that's putting out an album every year? What's the deal? Have everything that you're doing in your music business be trackable. And I guarantee you that will take away so much anxiety. At first, you may be like, 
Dex, the thought of setting up a spreadsheet gives me anxiety. I understand. Have AI do it for you. But the whole idea is create something that you can track data with. Um, David Allen has this great book called Getting Things Done, and he talks about this idea of your brain being like a stage. And that's an easy analogy for musicians to understand. Ma imagine your stage has too many musicians on it. Nobody can fit. They're all just jammed. You can't fit any more musicians. Well, in this analogy, musicians are like thoughts, thoughts of things that you need to get done, right? So you have to understand that to hold all of the responsibilities of your music business in here is to guarantee overwhelm. It's a guarantee. I can 100% of the time. I, I have 100% confidence saying that because if you try to fit all oh, it's going on up and just, and you just try to think it all, you're going to either forget stuff and that's going to make you anxious or you're going to be holding, it's like you're juggling a million things and you're going to be anxious because you're juggling 40 different things. You're like, I don't know, you're like, I don't even know a, fam I don't even know a famous juggler. You're like a famous juggler. <laughs> but the whole idea here is when you track things, now you can, best things to have is tracking that's updated automatically, but some stuff is manual. If it is a manual tracking event, like messaging a fan or something, do not put off in putting that data into the spreadsheet. I'm telling you right now, as someone who tracks data, the caveat to tracking is you gotta be consistent in putting the data into it. Because I have some people who will get the spreadsheet and they're like, yeah, I'll just message a bunch of people through the week and then on Saturday, I'll input all 50 to 100 names in here. And I'm like, dude, that is one that's not fun <laughs> sitting down for like an hour to two hours to input all that data and make sure it's on the right day and you t they're this far along in the conversation that's rough <laughs> but if you're able to as soon as you message someone boom that information is put in the spreadsheet now it's easier to keep up with because it's already there you don't have to worry about putting it in there because it's already there you can just update it now here's what i would do input the information into your spreadsheet as soon as you get the information to come in, as soon as possible, I use the messaging fan one because it's the most obvious. So a fan messages you, you immediately put into the spreadsheet, you tell them, you know, you start going through the conversation and then maybe one day a week, instead of inputting all the names and trying to figure out what day and all that stinking stupid minutia kind of work, what you can do instead is just go, okay, I talked to this person. Did I offer them to join my email list yet? Mm, yes, no, no, yes, no, yes. And now it's way easier to keep track of your data. So hopefully that helps you guys on the science of achievement. I could go, I've got videos, hours and hours worth of videos that dive into more of the tactics of how to achieve and what the different things look like when it comes to content, when it comes to selling, to marketing. All that different stuff is on different videos inside of this channel. But the frameworks that we have to look at in our business to actually achieve those things and get things done and do it is having good goals, having MART goals, <laughs> having consistent implementation and execution, tracking it consistently, knowing where you're at, right? Those things put together, I guarantee you, are gonna give you more of a handle on your music business, right? Now let's talk about the art of fulfillment, because we've talked about the science of achievement and how that's important and why we should like align our values to not interrupt with that. Because I think honestly, I think a lot of people have to either make that choice like I talked about um, when I was talking about the alignment issue, is some people will have to make the choice where they're either going to commit to the pre-programmed ideology that business is bad, or they're going to drop that and embrace the fact that business is good and it can be good and you can be a good force. So. We now know how to get our business together, but how do we be fulfilled and not go insane with burnout while we're working on our business? Well, the first thing reminds me of a Nietzsche quote. So Frederick Nietzsche once said, he who knows his why can bear any how. And the why you're doing this is so insanely important because I know some musicians, if I asked them and they were honest with me, some of them have been honest with me, but some of them try to skirt it. And if I ask them, why are you in this business? They would, if they were being honest, they would say money. They would say, I wanna be famous. I wanna make a lot of money. I wanna have a whole bunch of attention and I want girls and I want the X, Y, and Z. I want you know, a car, I want one in blue, I want one in yellow. You know, 
that's what I've had people tell me. But some people don't understand that that's not going to be a sufficient why to drive you through the pain that this industry will inevitably try to inflict upon you. <laughs> so I just, I hope people, first of all, have a solid foundation. What is your why? What is the reason that you're trying to become a professional musician and not just doing it as a hobby? Because for some people, it really would be best for them to do it as a hobby. You know, but there's this dream, but not a real commitment to the dream. It's more of a fantasy. But for those people who really should be hobbyists, I think the best thing for them would be to commit to being hobbyists. But for those of you that when you think about it and you're like, no, I want to do music. Music isn't just like a thing I can come home from a nine to five to do. It's something I need to do all the time and that needs to be my livelihood. Well, if you're in that breed of people, you're in that, that caliber, well, you need to understand that there needs to be a why that's going to push you through this. Why are you into this? Are you into this because you just love the creation of music and you couldn't live without it? It's like air. Or did you get into this because, you know, working a nine to five job is hard and music seems like an easy way out. And some of my coworkers have told me that I have a good voice. Like, is it that kind of situation? Or is it a situation of like, no, I'm actually genuinely committed to this. And I'm going to figure out how to make this work. It's clearly worked for other artists. They're not more intelligent than me. Some of them are younger than me. I can figure it out if they can figure it out. That's the mindset we need to take. And I know that I'm a little aggressive. Like, they're not as intelligent as me. They may be more intelligent than us. But what I'm saying is you need to be optimistic to the point of like, I can learn how to do it. If they learn how to do it, you know, for example, um, you know, if, uh, who's a good example? Russ. Russ is an independent artist that got, to, you know, millions of followers and all this kind of stuff. If Russ can do it, then I can do like 10% of that. I can do a couple hundred thousand. You know, he's a few million fans. I can do a few hundred thousand. I can do that. I can do a few, you know, I, I may not, some of you may be like, I can't maybe get to 4 million monthly listeners right now in this niche that I'm in, but I can get to, I can get to 70,000 monthly listeners. I can get me to 70,000. You see what I'm saying? That mindset of even if I'm not going to 100% one for one duplicate their success, I can learn the strategies that they use to be successful and implement them into my business so that I'm not over here trying to reinvent the wheel. I'm not over here just getting arrows in my backs trying to figure out how this all works, even though there's someone else who's got a clear cut path they've already carved out that I could borrow from here, right? So we have to look at, sorry, I kind of went off on a tangent of achievement a little bit there, but we have to understand why we got into this. And if we know our why, we're going to figure it out. You know what I'm saying? Those mindsets of how we're going to figure it out come from knowing your why. They come from that solid foundation and understanding. Now, another part of the art of fulfillment is the contribution and the impact that your music has. I definitely recommend that figuring out a way to make your music have an impact. It doesn't have to be some big um, social activist cause. It might be if that's something that aligns with your values, but it doesn't always have to be. For some of you, maybe it's donating to a charity. For some of you, maybe it's donating to a local you know, food bank or whatever it is. Maybe it's bringing awareness to a particular issue. There's some kind of impact or you keep it even more local and you just try to figure out how you can impact your fans the best. Instead of trying to like create a song and create marketing all around this big movement, just focus on your own community and figure out how can I best contribute and add value and impact their lives. So maybe you do um, a fan meetup or something where fans get together and they hang out at this venue and you bring catering and you do some acoustic songs and Everybody has a good time and there's like, it's just a big party where we all hang out and celebrate music. That's a way just to try and provide value and impact. And sure, if you charged $5 a head, $10 a head, $20 a head, depending on how much you're trying to provide value, you know, because obviously if you're going to provide catering and a live performance and like a DJ, whatever, that's going to cost money. So they would happily pay an admission fee. But it's like, 
that's a way that they can get together now and have this experience where they're with a bunch of like-minded people. There's potential networking that's happening between them. They're around you, the artist. They get to see you in a close-up setting, see a performance from you. It's intimate. Nobody else gets it. Maybe you create a no phone rule. So it's like literally nobody else gets to experience this but you. And uh, like, there's different ways of approaching it. But the mindset here is how do I contribute to my audience? How do I actually bring them value as opposed to how do I just, you know, extract money from them and all that kind of stuff? You don't want to always be thinking about it from monetary because that's what that leads to. If you're only thinking about it from how do I make more money, eventually the fans turn into just numbers as opposed to people who you're trying to impact and have value. So if you're trying to have a fulfilling career, make sure that you're focusing on the fans and how you can contribute to them, how you can add value and impact their life positively. I guarantee you that will lead to so much fulfillment, it's crazy. Just knowing that you have impact on one person gives such a feeling of fulfillment, much less 10, 100 people coming up and telling you that something you did matters to them deeply. So know how you're going to contribute to this. And then this is one thing that I really hope people understand when it comes to the art of fulfillment, which is understanding, I know it sounds kind of cliche, but hear me out. The journey versus the destination. I can tell you firsthand that when I went on tour, one of my favorite tours I've ever been on uh, was a tour with Seven Dust and Mark Tremonti. Uh, who else was on the band? Cane Hill, Low Water, and Us. It was a five-band bill. Big old bill, but I can tell you right now, that was one of the greatest tours I was on. I was getting to hang around with Seven Dust and Tremonti. All those people are really down-to-earth and chill. So that was great to just network and talk and meet genuine people on the road. That's fulfilling. But I can tell you right now, if I had lived through that tour as if I was trying to get to the destination, which is the end of the tour, where we made the most sales we'd ever made in a tour and all this kind of stuff, right? If, if, if I was focusing on that, I would have ignored the beauty of that entire journey, of that entire month, where I was meeting new people every night, shaking thousands of hands every single night and meeting new people, meeting people in the industry who knew other people in the industry, not even thinking about it, but just like networking with people and then realizing like, oh, I was talking to this person and they know this person and they know this person. It's crazy how it works out. Like I'm telling you, hanging out with Tremonti on tour, I was able to then like, I was in Oklahoma in a studio and I mentioned the story and they were like, oh, I know Tremonti. And it was like this whole little link up situation. It was like, Wow, you never know who knows who. But if I would have ignored all that to focus on, I'm just trying to get to the destination, man. Let's get these shows through so that I can get to that last day where I get the paycheck. I would have gotten there. I would have gotten the paycheck and then been like, cool, um, now what? That's what would have happened. You know why? Because when I got home, that's what happened. <laughs> that's literally what happened. I got home. I got the paycheck. I was like, oh so awesome that's great we had a great tour this is so cool what's up what do we do now that we what's the next thing right that's immediately what happens when you get to a milestone i'm telling you right now the milestone you get a certain level of uh, you get a feeling of pride and of like i did it yes but very quickly hopefully it's uh kind of replaced with so what's the next thing so what, what's the next thing that we're going to go to where if i take the time to enjoy the journey Even if the end result, I get to the destination and it's not so great. I've been on tours not so, not so luxurious. I've been on tours where we traveled through New Mexico, uh, Oregon, Idaho, California, Nevada, that whole chunk of the country, Utah. And there were times where we drove, we drove like 24 hours from Oklahoma to Seattle to play for like 15 people. And then the next night, because our drummer wasn't 21 and I wasn't 21, we couldn't even play in the establishment. Um, so our, you know, like we ended up making like, we ended up making like 400, 500 bucks from the whole tour. So we all came home with like $125, you know, after being gone for three weeks. It, oh gosh, I've had some not so luxurious tours, but I can tell you right now that some of the memories that I've made on those terrible tours are amazing. They're, they're hilarious, fun stories of the journey. For example, I was on this another terrible tour, totally different terrible tour. 
um, I should write it, A Series of Terrible Tours by Daxton Page. Um, <laughs> I was on this one tour where we were with an extreme heavy death metal band, Bill. Uh, we are not death metal. We are like stadium rock, octane rock, Breaking Benjamin. That's like our little zone of rock. These guys were like, you know, playing bass, blast beats and just going crazy up there. So it's like the audience would hear that and we'd walk up on stage and they're like, what just happened? It was like a night and day switch. Well, on this terrible tour, um, we were driving from Los Angeles, California, where from that show we made a whopping $12. That We went from there to Reno, Nevada, which is like nine hours or more. It's a long drive. It's a stupid drive for the next day for a show. It's, that's what it is. Um, well, we got there, and it turns out the show had been canceled for weeks. And <laughs> we showed up, and we were like, hey, we're, so we're here for the gig. And they're like, did no one, um, no one told you? We're like... Tell me what? They're like, we canceled that like a few weeks ago. And we're like, no one did in fact tell us. But we're here and they go, well, we have another band playing tonight. Maybe you can ask if you can open for them. So guys, we opened up for a cover band during a zombie walk that was happening in Reno. But uh that was an, the fact that we even like made it all, we drove, it's like, we drove this way. I don't care who's playing. By this point, I don't care who's playing. I'm making my way onto this bill. I'm going to get onto this bill. And uh, it was a good show. Then we were, um, we were in the van and me and Zach were, you know, um, partaking in some herbal remedies that he had. And all of a sudden, 14 cops come running around the corner because we're parked in a back. It's like, here's a back alley and then there's a, our van and then the back door to the venue. Cops come by the boatload running through this alley and down the alley. And we're like, you know, I felt like that guy in Tommy Boy when Chris Farley's running at him and he goes, ah! that was that was us in the van, um, very scared. And so when all the cops had eventually passed, you know, we very quickly hopped out of the van, smoke was everywhere, and uh, we shut it, we run in there, and as soon as we open the door, our singer and bass player are like, get the hell in here. Someone just got shot outside. And we're like, what? I don't, I don't even know. I'll tell you right now, guys. Um, I'll never forget that story. I'll never forget that terrible show. It, it led to a, a memory that, in the moment, was very intense. But looking back on it, I just laugh. You know, I just, I just have to laugh at that. I don't know. I, we went to a... We wouldn't have even been in any trouble if we'd have just known the show was canceled. But sure enough, no one told us. So we just showed up to the canceled gig. <laughs> showed up to this canceled gig. Snuck our way onto the bill anyway. Could have just went to the hotel and been, been in safe, safe territory. Maybe we wouldn't have. Who knows? It's Reno. Uh, but, you know, it was just the amalgamation of all that stuff. Even though that was a terrible tour. I hope you guys enjoyed that little story, by the way. Um, even though that was a terrible tour... I still look back on it and I don't feel anger, I don't feel resentment, I don't feel any of that. I just feel like gratitude for making it out alive and, and just gratitude for having had experiences like that so that when I have these amazing experiences, I cherish it even more. Because I'll tell you right now, nobody likes the people that get success overnight and one of the reasons, among many, that people don't like that type of person is because they don't know what it's like to have paid their dues. I, I think there is a certain time where people use paying your dues as gatekeeping, but I think there's also certain things to be said for going out and kind of, it's like you're never gonna figure out how to wrestle unless you get on the mat and you wrestle. You know what I'm saying? So I think there's a certain point where you do have to like get your feet wet, go play some bar gigs, play some, whatever gigs so that you can kind of know what it's like for the average person in there in the music business and then you figure out like okay there's clearly a step above this right but a lot of people just get exposed to the glamorous life and then their 15 minutes is up and they have no idea what the real business is like and it's just a nightmare for their career for the rest of it but they fade out a lot quicker when that happens 
But the other artists who've understood what this business is like and they kind of came from humble roots, it's like they come up from humble roots, build their foundation, get a little mainstream juice on top of it, and then when that dies off, they still got their foundation. Where other people, they build up from the beginning from their, that's all mainstream, and then when their 15 minutes dies, there really isn't a floor anymore. Uh, be, because people in mainstream music, are, it's, listening habits are very fleeting, let's just put it that way. So um, that's when it comes to the art of fulfillment, one of the most important things I can impart upon you is enjoy the journey of this. I know there's gonna be times where you're like, oh, I don't wanna sit here and record videos, but I guarantee you, when you have that moment, like for me, when I played all these crappy shows, and then one day I'm like opening up for these Grammy nominated, Grammy award winning bands, and there's sellout shows, and I'm playing for so many people, we're selling thousands of merch and stuff, and I'm, by the way, I'm not doing that to be like braggadocious. I'm trying to tell you guys that, that this is possible, because it is. And just having those moments, me and my singer, me and my bass player or drummer sitting with each other and going, dude, this, this is a good night. Like the, like the feeling of that coming from humble beginnings and building a foundation and getting to that point, man, like I, I can't impart to you how valuable that experience is. And appreciating the journey is what makes it so sweet. Okay, now let's kind of start to wrap up here a little bit. I know I've been sort of going long in this video. We wanna bridge the gap because I want you to think of it like a spectrum. If you think on one end you have fulfillment and on one end you have achievement, where on the spectrum are you right now, right? Like some of y'all right now are pedal to the metal, achievement all the way and not even thinking about fulfillment. That's not a good place to be in. Counterintuitively, some of y'all all about the art like I only do what is fulfilling and if writing an email to my fans is not fulfilling I will not do it because it's not natural to that's not healthy either that's both extremes black and white thinking like that are not helpful to, to your career in either capacity one will lead to burnout one will also just lead to nothing <laughs> like because you won't start it because it'll just lead to nothing but this you'll start it but you'll just be like and you'll go crazy um, so avoid being totally 100% pushed to either side here. But think of the spectrum and think of where are you right now. And if you are on the ends here, where would you like to be? Now, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to tell you right now. You're never going to be just right in the middle because I know what some of y'all just said. Well, I want to be perfectly balanced. I want to be perfectly balanced between art and business. It's a perfect balance. Listen, I understand. I wrote a whole book called The Musician's Dilemma that's about this balancing act right of how do we balance art with business and business with art and how do we make the yin and yang yin and yang right but what we need to understand is that at any moment in your life you're in a season right if you're in that startup phase you're going to be in a season where you're more achievement focused but if you've just been too far over here you got to bring it back in somewhere where it's tolerable right every individual's difference for some of y'all to have like a lot more fulfillment in your life to where you're having a real good time and can work even harder, some of y'all just need to go from here to here, right? You just need to back off the achievement like obsession for us just a little bit and some of y'all that will bring in the happiness and joy and fulfillment needed so that when you act on your music business, you're loving the process and you're enjoying the journey. Um, conversely, some of y'all need to go from here to here, right? Some of y'all need to pull back way back. And then conversely, some of y'all need to get pulled from like over here to borderline over here, right? But what if there's a season where, Dax, I was in the achievement mode and I did achieve. I got to a million monthly listeners. I'm making like $1,000 to $5,000 a month for my music business. You know, I can pay my rent with that and I can do this and X, Y, and Z. I'm actually doing it. Well, now we maybe need to figure out, okay, how do I delegate and build systems so that I can go more into the fulfillment side. Now I can go more into, I'm just enjoying the fruits of the labor. Yeah, I'll do work on maintaining the systems I've built, but I'm just enjoying the fruits of that. Oh, now it's time for a new album, a new thing that needs to be done. We're gonna move over to this side. So I want you guys to be thinking about how do I bridge the gap between you know fulfillment and achievement. It's all about understanding where on that spectrum you're gonna be at depending on what season 
in your career you're at. Okay, because I'm just telling you, in the very beginning, you're going to be more achievement driven. It's just the point, you know, it's just how it is. But at some point, after like building the foundations and grinding it out, there will be a point where you'll need to focus on fulfillment. You'll need to focus on your friends, your family, decompression time, making sure that you don't lose that relationship with music, right? That's an important part of this. So it's all a balancing act, but just kind of know that you're never going to truly be perfectly 100% balanced between the two things, okay? So you have to balance hustle and grind with reflect, reflection, and this will help you avoid burnout because when you get too far achievement driven, you can pull yourself back and ground yourself. I've had moments like that where I'm just so burnt out from work, but then I go hang out with my wife, my kids, and like, I'm good. I'm, I, I, I'm grounded now to my why and why I'm happy. My happiness is not tied into my monetary state or anything like that. It's all tied into what I believe with, you know, my faith and, and my family and all this kind of stuff, right? So you understanding your why is going to help you determine, okay, how do I like get more into my fulfillment? How do I like actually enjoy this journey as opposed to just being like, you know, a worker bee that's just, I can't do it anymore. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I hope you guys have gotten a lot of value from this video. So before we log out of here. What I want to do is I want to give you guys sort of like a, um, a suggestion. I would hope that you reflect on your why and like really think about this. What is the why that is going to endure painful moments? So here's how you test it. Give yourself a why. Here's my why. Now imagine something very catastrophic just happened in your music business. Somebody stole all of your songs and they stole your whole like Spotify for Artists account. They hacked you, they took everything and then they copyrighted your artist's name and you can't even use that name anymore and they legally own it. Is your why going to keep you grounded then? And if you're like, hell no, that's the worst thing that's ever, like, then we don't have a strong enough why. <laughs> you know, like I, that's the reality of it because I'm telling you right now, I could lose everything tomorrow. I could have all my gear taken away. I, they could take all the money. They could take the house. They could take literally everything. As long as I've got my family, I, I've got my faith, I'm good. Like, that's, I'm, I'm set, right? I'll figure out how to get it back, right? My fulfillment will not change because I am with who matters. But if I'm focused too much on monetary things, right? Or if you're too focused on the material, when the material goes away, so does your happiness. So does your fulfillment, right? So, Focus on what is your why and then start to establish a game plan and not just any game plan, right? Figure out what works. I recommend watching a few of the videos here. Start figuring out what actually works. If you'd like some one-on-one -on -one help with your music business, building out that game plan, there's a link in the description to apply for a one-on-one -on -one call. So you can go and check that out if that's something that's interesting to you. Otherwise, hit the subscribe button or the like button and the notification bell, all that good kind of youtube -y stuff. It really helps out the channel a lot. And if it provided some value for you, I'd love to hear from it in the comments. So let me uh, see you guys down in the comments. And I look forward to seeing you on another video inside the Musicians Ignite. Take care.